Thank you all for coming. Before we begin, I want to thank those who contributed to this project. Many thanks are owed to Eric Holland, Curator of Education for the State Historical Society of North Dakota, who was able to make the drive up from Bismarck today. And to Dr. And to Dr. Michael Lansing, Chair of the History Department at Augsburg University, for the opportunity to deliver the inaugural Judge Dale V. Sandstrom Lecture this past summer. Additional thanks are also owed to Leah Bazuski, Director of the Grand Forks County Historical Society, for the opportunity to come to Grand Forks and deliver this lecture. I would be remiss if I did not thank those who guided me through the research phase of this project. These include Robert Ansley for the U.S. District Court for the District of North Dakota, Kurt Hansen at the University of North Dakota's Elwyn B. Robinson Department of Special Collections, John Hallberg at North Dakota State University's Institute for Regional Studies, Daniel Sauerwein at the State Historical Society of North Dakota, and Wade Pop of the National Archives and Records Administration in Kansas City, Missouri. Without their efforts, this project never would have come to fruition. Before we begin the story of Judge Charles Fremont Amidon, I want to touch upon a personal note. There's an old adage that you should never judge a book by its cover. Before beginning this project, I began searching for previous works on Judge Amidon. I came across a book Eric Holland mentioned by historian Kenneth Smimo of Minnesota State University Moorhead and ordered a copy. When I opened the book, I discovered that it was previously owned by a distant cousin of Judge Amidon's through the inscription on the first page. Needless to say, the excitement it instilled absolutely made it appropriate to judge a book by its cover in this instance. Without further ado, let us begin the story of Judge Amidon and explore his legacy in North Dakota during World War I. On April 2nd, 1917, Woodrow Wilson delivered a speech to Congress requesting a declaration of war on Germany. The focal point of the speech was to establish the overarching purpose for American entry into the war, to make the world safe for democracy. As noble as this goal was, in order for it to be attained, the United States home front first had to be made safe for democracy. During World War I, the United States home front, and that of North Dakota in particular, became the very antithesis to the country's stated purpose for entering the war. During World War I, North Dakota became particularly suspicious of its large German immigrant population and displayed strong hostilities towards it. These suspicions and hostilities only grew on June 15, 1917, when Congress passed the Espionage Act to suppress disloyal utterances and actions towards the United States and its war effort. The act contained extremely vague definitions of terms such as disloyal and sedition, along with a wide-ranging list of acts which constituted a violation. Furthermore, Scores of cases came before United States District Court Judge Charles Fremont Amidon of alleged Espionage Act violations. Through Judge Amidon's approach to the law and ability to quell wartime hysteria, the home front became safe for democracy with his efforts to protect free speech and civil liberties. As significant of a role as Charles Amidon had in making the home front safe for democracy, he was hardly the first member of his family to do so. The first Amadon ancestor to come to America, Roger Amadon, arrived at Salem, Massachusetts in the early 1630s after narrowly escaping religious persecution in France. On the surface, Massachusetts seemed the logical choice to emigrate to, given its founding as a safe haven from religious persecution. However, Amidon's ancestor realized that this was far from the case, as Salem was in the midst of its infamous witch trials. These conditions proved highly formative for the Amidon family line. It not only instilled a strong sense of importance towards making the Americas safe for democracy, but foreshadowed events to come for Judge Amidon during World War I. This tradition of protecting democracy in the United States only continued with each subsequent generation, 
as Roger Amidon's grandson and great-grandson fought in the American Revolution. Nearly a century later, Charles' father, John Smith Amidon, took the family tradition even further as a staunch abolitionist and the only one in the community of Chautauqua County, New York. Charles' father was the only person in the community to cast a vote for the Free Soil Party and frequently used his home as a refuge on the Underground Railroad for escaped slaves in search of their freedom in the North. As significant of a role as Charles Amidon had in his family history of making the home front safe for democracy, the roles of his wife, Beulah McHenry Amidon, and daughter, Beulah Amidon Ratliff, in the women's suffrage movements simply cannot be overlooked. While Judge Amidon sought to quiet wartime hysteria amid cases of alleged Espionage Act violations, his wife and daughter faced a similar task in making the home front safe for democracy. Locally, Beulah McHenry Amidon and Beulah Amidon Ratliff were leading figures in the women's suffrage movement in North Dakota. Over the course of the women's suffrage movements, their roles became national in both significance and activity with their participation in the marches on Washington, D.C. Women's suffrage first began in North Dakota through organizing efforts led by Judge Amidon's wife, who formed the North Dakota branch of the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage. The first meeting came in the form of a luncheon attended by over 140 North Dakota women. At the time of the meeting, Efforts to gain suffrage in North Dakota had been defeated in a state referendum. Under state law, the same referendum could not be put on the ballot again for a minimum of five years. This outcome held weighty implications for women. Since the birth of the United States, women had been excluded from representation in American government, despite the oft-quoted mantra which succinctly described the cause which colonists fought for in the American Revolution. Taxation without representation. Although the American Revolution itself may have been centered specifically on taxation, the same mantra, without representation, fit into a larger narrative for women in the United States, as every government decision up to this point had been made without their input. Furthermore, although women could not vote, they could be elected to Congress, as the example of Representative Jeanette Rankin from Montana demonstrated. The fight for women's suffrage was in every sense of the word, a fight. This became all the more apparent to Judge Amidon's wife and daughter when they marched on the Capitol and White House in 1917. In the newspaper article pictured on the slide, Amidon's daughter recounted the violent resistance women's suffragists met from military service members and local police officers. I have stood perfectly quiet and empty handed on Pennsylvania Avenue the proudest street and the proudest city in the world, and seen a police officer laugh while a crowd of hoodlums snatched at me and a sailor in the uniform of the United States Navy doubled up his fist and deliberately struck at me in the chest. I have seen a woman who weighed less than 100 pounds knocked down by another sailor in uniform, dragged 20 feet by the ribbon around her neck. I have seen three sailors in uniform climb to the second story of a private house and tear down the stars and stripes while two police officers stood by and made no attempt at interference. I have seen the hole made in a pane of glass in the ceiling of a room by a bullet fired through a lighted window at which three women were sitting. I have seen a girl knocked down by two Negro messenger boys and the young army officer in uniform who came to her assistance locked up for disorderly conduct while her assailant stood by and jeered. I have seen a newspaper man find $25 in the courts of justice in the nation's capital because he struck a man who had knocked down two girls who were walking quietly along the street. I have seen a policeman and a policewoman and a plainclothes man snatch a woman's property from her hands, cruelly twisting her arms as they did so. These things did not happen in old Russia they were merely incidents in a few days of rioting which occurred in the capital of the United States during last week. 
In addition to violent resistance, women suffragists were also threatened with arrest for each subsequent picket. The scene described by Beulah Amidon demonstrated that, that if the United States was to make the world safe for democracy, it must first do so domestically. As if the issues of free speech and civil liberties which Judge Amidon faced in his courtroom were not significant enough, the violent opposition unleashed towards his wife and daughter by armed forces members tasked to fight for democracy overseas on American soil towards women suffragists made this all the more apparent. As such, this endeavor became a family affair for the Amidons with free speech and civil liberties far from confined to the judge's courtroom. Judge Amidon's legal philosophy centered on two overarching factors, the impact which the law had on everyday life and how the law could be simplified as much as possible. Although Amidon's approach to the law continued to evolve with each issue he faced over the course of his legal career, these two factors proved the biggest constants. When it came to Amidon's approach to the law, one of the most significant aspects to discuss included three major reforms he implemented. Each began on a local level and have since become national in both scope and impact. The first major reform which Judge Amidon implemented came in 1893 when he was appointed to a three-man commission by the governor of North Dakota to revise and rewrite the state's laws. Amidon was specifically tasked with revising the civil and civil procedural codes. Evidently, these reforms were not only significant, but successful, as they remain standard legal procedure in North Dakota today. Furthermore, it garnered a swift nomination and confirmation to the bench as the U.S. District Court judge for the District of North Dakota. What made this nomination especially significant was the fact that President Grover Cleveland had never heard of Amidon prior to his unanimous recommendation by the additional candidates for the same position. When he later reflected upon the nomination process, Amidon recounted Cleveland's decision as having been rooted in the strong consensus among the other candidates that he was the best choice for the vacant position on the bench. In 1906, Amidon delivered a speech to the Minnesota State Bar Association, where he advocated for appellate courts to no longer overturn lower court decisions based solely on technical errors, particularly if it did not produce an adverse outcome in the case. Amidon's desire for what has become known as the harmless error rule stemmed from an astute observation on his part regarding recent trends in the law which deeply disturbed him. This observation was best described by his biographer, Kenneth Smimo, as the straitjacket or common law approach. In a letter to Theodore Roosevelt, who caught wind of the address in 1907 and became an ardent supporter of Amidon's, the judge argued that the entire permanent body of American law has been emanated from men living in a law library. It has been the product of study rather than experience. If you want to make a Pharisee, put a man in a library and authorize him to make rules for other people's lives. In a little while, he will know a great deal about his rules and very little about life. Then he will take the next step and declare that his rules are more important than life. Ultimately, what began in 1906 as a simple speech delivered at a state bar association convention became nationally recognized. Amidon's 1906 address to the Minnesota State Bar Association Convention marked the first of many speeches of his to be quoted at length by President Roosevelt throughout his second term and sparked the beginning of a close friendship between the two. Amidon's address served as the beginning of major efforts on Roosevelt's part to implement the harmless error rule towards the end of his presidency. Furthermore, when Roosevelt ran for a third term as the Bull Moose Party candidate on an enhanced progressive platform, this came as a major result of Amidon's influence. Ultimately, it would not be until 1919, long after Roosevelt had left office and Amidon was in the midst of hearing Espionage Act cases, that the harmless error rule was officially implemented. The third reform which Amidon implemented 
came in the midst of World War I and the scores of Espionage Act cases tried before him. During World War I, North Dakota brought the highest prosecution rate of cases under the Espionage Act per capita among U.S. states. The Espionage Act was passed by Congress on June 15, 1917, shortly after the passage of the Selective Service Act, which enabled the federal government to conscript young men for military service. Despite the large number of Espionage Act cases brought before him, Judge Amidon almost always granted a demur or directed a verdict of acquittal of the defendant due to the language of the act. The Espionage Act contained language that was extremely vague in its definition of the terms sedition and disloyal and had such a wide ranging list of acts which constituted violations that it became nearly impossible to not violate. As such, Judge Amidon once again took on a leading reformer approach through his insistence that any cases brought before him lay out specific definitions of the language in the Espionage Act and the violation which the defendant was accused of. Amidon's concerns were widely documented in a series of letters exchanged with noted First Amendment scholar and Harvard Law School professor Zechariah Chaffee Jr where Judge Amidon likened the Espionage Act of 1917 to the English law of treason, which considered imagining the king's death a crime. As if the provisions of the Espionage Act were not troublesome enough, the wartime hysteria which overcame jurors described by Judge Amidon only raised the stakes for democracy on the home front during World War I. For the first six months after June 15, 1917, I tried war cases before jurymen who were candid, sober, intelligent businessmen whom I had known for 30 years and who under ordinary circumstances would have had the highest respect for my declarations of law. But during that period, they looked back into my eyes with the savagery of wild animals, saying by their manner, away with this twiddling, let us get at him. Men believed during that period that the only verdict in a war case which could show loyalty was a verdict of guilty. With the large number of Espionage Act cases brought before him and the wartime hysteria which afflicted many jurors, Judge Amidon was tasked with establishing cru crucial legal precedents. Amidon's approach to these cases proved to be of such significance that Judge Thomas Charles Munger, a U.S. District Court judge for the District of Nebraska, consulted him about how to approach the law under the Espionage Act in the letter pictured on the slide. Through Judge Amidon's approach to the law, the reforms which he implemented became so profound that they went from local in scope to national in the implications which they held for American democracy and jurisprudence for years to come. As brilliant of a jurist as Judge Amidon proved throughout his legal career, it was during World War I where he distinguished himself the most. Of the scores of Espionage Act cases brought before him, a mere 103 indictments were upheld, 15 cases went to trial, and 13% of the total caseload resulted in conviction. The driving force behind these prosecutions was the United States Attorney for North Dakota, Melvin Hildreth. Hildreth was a staunch anti-hyphenist and opponent of the Nonpartisan League. He also had a son who served in World War I, a fact which inherently served as an additional driving force behind his vigorous prosecutions. Despite the daunting caseload which Amidon faced, along with severe external pressures, the judge firmly upheld the rule of law on the home front to protect free speech and civil liberties. One of the first Espionage Act cases which Judge Amidon heard was United States v. B. H. Chute. The defendant was accused of violating the Espionage Act after he commented to a fellow farmer that World War I was a rich man's war and it is all a graft and swindle. And if you, if you do not believe it, look at the price of wheat. These remarks came in response to the food rationing and price fixing which the federal government engaged in during World War I. Although these regulations were crucial to the war effort, they adversely affected farmers and their ability to cultivate the necessary crops 
to feed Americans domestically and abroad. Chute's attorney filed for a demur, which was subsequently sustained by Judge Amidon, given the lack of evidence of an Espionage Act violation or criminal intent to do so on the defendant's part. In his written opinion, Judge Amidon listed three key factors which made for a valid indictment. The language must have been willfully uttered. The language uttered must have been of a character which violated the Espionage Act. And the language uttered must have been uttered in a context where one could logically conclude that the remarks could produce some of the results which the Espionage Act prohibited. These three criteria proved integral in Amidon's efforts to establish a legal precedent for what constituted a valid indictment under the Espionage Act, as evidenced by the citation of U.S. v. Chute in a dozen Espionage Act cases over the course of the past century. In the case of United States v. John H. Wyshek, the defendant, a former North Dakota state senator of German descent and one of the more prosperous ethnic Germans in the community, was charged with an Espionage Act violation for his distribution of pamphlets titled German Successes in America. While to ardent anti-hyphenists, the distribution of these pamphlets might appear to be an effort to spread German propaganda, what it in reality consisted of was an effort to highlight the fact that many Germans, although not yet fully assimilated, had still attained success in America and were well on their way to becoming part of the country's melting pot. Furthermore, Wyshek was a generous subscriber to the Liberty Loan campaign, having purchased $65,000 worth of Liberty Bonds. As such, the jury was unable to come to an agreement on whether to indict Wyshek, which led Amadon to issue an order to dismiss the case. One of the most controversial Espionage Act cases argued before Amadon was that of United States v. Job W. Brinton. The charges against Brinton stemmed from remarks he made about the implications of World War I for industrial corporations in the United States and the lucrative profits to be made from American entry into the war. One steel company made 70 million in one year before the war started. And when war started, they raised the price of steel from $29 to $92 per ton and made 270 million of dollars the next year. Where did it go? Robbing corporations, making millions, making it hard to raise wheat. Gasoline has gone up, twine, shoes. We claim these organizations are pro-German. We have to take money out of children's savings accounts to buy war savings stamps to pay for big prices the government pays for steel. The reason why we have to buy Liberty Bonds is because government pays all the money for excessive profits to the DuPont Powder Company and other corporations. The DuPont Powder Company made 78 millions in one year. During his appeal to the jury, in addition to accusing Brinton of an Espionage Act violation, Hildreth argued that Brinton's remarks came out of a desire to incite class warfare. Judge Amidon, in his charge to the jury, picture on the slide, expressed wholehearted disagreement, stating, the people who are benefited by an existing condition always say that the victims who suffer from it and want to change it are stirring up class against class. That is the stock argument. If it could prevail, we would never get any change in any existing condition. Judge Amidon's response to Hildreth's charge was not only out of character, given his typically objective approach to the law, but one which particularly had to resonate with him as he came from a long line of people who sought to implement similar changes. This was especially so when one considered the single historical example which Amidon cited to support his remarks, the abolition of slavery in the United States, a cause which his father passionately supported. Evidently, the charge also resonated with the jury, given its decision to acquit Brinton without any direction from the bench. The case of United States v. Walter Thomas Mills brought about similar controversy. Mills was a strong supporter of the Nonpartisan League and renowned Socialist Party organizer in North Dakota. The accusations against Mills came in response to a speech he delivered in Fargo, where he asked the rhetorical question, who are the men who are fighting for us in France? They are not the sons of members of chambers of commerce in this country. 
They are not the sons of commercial travelers. They are not bankers or merchant sons, but they are your boys. For every thousand soldiers killed in France, there is one additional millionaire in America. In, adi in addition to the inflammatory nature of these re remarks, the audience also included six men eligible for conscription. As such, this gave Hildreth all the evidence he needed to bring an Espionage Act violation case before Judge Amidon. However, it was quickly discovered that the men who claimed to have transcribed Mill's speech had done so in a selective manner. This was demonstrated when Mill's attorney read aloud a 100-word passage from the Bible and asked the men who transcribed the defendant's speech to repeat the action, a task which they failed to do even with the same passage read three times. Evidently, this proved sufficient for Judge Amidon as he directed a verdict of not guilty to the jury from the bench. When one examined Mill's remarks and compared them to those of Job Brinton, both discussed similar subjects, the implications of World War I for everyday life in the United States. The impact which the law would have on everyday life was also one of two major factors which Amidon took into account in his approach to the law. Although Mills, unlike Brinton, made his remarks in the presence of men eligible for conscription and with direct reference to the armed forces, these remarks served as a greater reflection of what Judge Amidon described in the jury charge in U.S. v. Brinton. What's more, given the ties which both defendants had to the Nonpartisan League and Hildreth's ardent opposition to its platform, political partisanship also served as an additional factor behind his efforts along with wartime hysteria. As one can gather thus far, for a case tried under the Espionage Act to make it past a grand jury, let alone result in a conviction, was exceedingly rare in Judge Amidon's courtroom. In this section, four cases which prove the exception to the rule will be explored in relation to Judge Amidon's approach to the law to, de to determine whether the indictment in each case met the criteria laid out in U.S. v. Chute. The first case tried under the Espionage Act in North Dakota was United States v. Kate Richards O'Hare. The defendant was a renowned Socialist Party organizer and orator who vehemently opposed American entry into the war. In a speech delivered in Bowman, North Dakota, with many men eligible for conscription present, O'Hare remarked that any persons who enlisted in the Army of the United States of America for service in France would be used for fertilizer and that is all that they were good for, and that the women of the United States were nothing more nor less than brood sows to raise children to get into the army and be made into fertilizer. Prior to the grand jury proceedings, Judge Amidon, who was supposed to hear O'Hare's case, reassured her that the indictment was deeply flawed and would therefore be demurred. However, unfortunate circumstances prevented this plan from being met out. Judge Amidon was called to serve on the U.S. Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals in St. Louis and previously had a writ of prejudice filed against him. Ironically, the judge who heard O'Hare's case, Martin Wade, proved no less prejudiced in his approach to the law in U.S. v. O'Hare. Even before the case came before him, Judge Wade maintained a reputation as a staunch anti-hyphenate and outspoken opponent of socialism. Despite the obvious bias, which would inherently play into O'Hare's case, no writ of prejudice was filed against Judge Wade. In both her speech and testimony, O'Hare stated that although she opposed American entry into the war and thought it foolish to voluntarily enlist given the high likelihood young men already faced of being drafted, she nonetheless admired and encouraged those who deemed voluntary enlistment the right thing to do. Despite O'Hare's testimony and that of witnesses who confirmed her effort to clarify her remarks, O'Hare was nonetheless indicted and subsequently found guilty in her trial. Judge Wade sentenced O'Hare to five years in the federal penitentiary in Jefferson City, Missouri, and denied her attorney's petition for a retrial, but did allow for a writ of error. O'Hare's case was subsequently appealed to the U.S. Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals in St. Louis. In the appeal, O'Hare's attorney cited the same argument as he did before Judge Wade for overturning O'Hare's conviction, that O'Hare was charged with a criminal intent rather than a criminal act. 
Although O'Hare's remarks and Bowman may have been made in the presence of draft eligible men, no evidence was presented by the prosecution that she explicitly sought to obstruct draft registration or voluntary enlistment in the armed forces. In Hildreth's brief, the main argument presented for upholding O'Hare's conviction referred to previous contexts where the defendant delivered the same speech, such as North Carolina during the peak of the state's draft riots. Ultimately, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals concurred with Judge Wade and upheld O'Hare's conviction. It was not until 1921 when Kate Richards O'Hare would be released from prison and subsequently pardoned by President Warren Harding. This case and its outcome set a dangerous precedent for future cases tried under the Espionage Act in North Dakota. The highly subjective approach to the law by Judge Wade in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals made it abundantly clear that the home front was not safe for democracy, a notion which became increasingly apparent in the case of the United States v. John Fontana. In U.S. v. Fontana, the defendant, a German-born pastor in North Dakota, was charged with an Espionage Act violation in response to a series of statements made during sermons and prayer services led to his congregation. Some of these statements included, the sinking of the Lusitania was justified and there was no reason whatever for the United States to take up arms against Germany. He felt proud of the noble fight the Germans were making in the war. He frequently prayed for the successes of the armies of Germany over the armies of the United States. He desired the success of the enemies of the United States and that God gave the German military a weapon with which to vanquish its foes, the submarine. As if these remarks were not enough to merit an Espionage Act violation, in Hildreth's eyes, the fact that nearly everyone in the congregation and town Fontana lived in was of German descent only strengthened the case against him. Furthermore, many of the men in Fontana's congregation was, were draft eligible, which raised the question of whether he possessed the desire to discourage draft registration and voluntary enlistment. However, these remarks were made prior to American entry into the war. After the United States declared war on Germany, Fontana began to pray for reconciliation between the two nations, according to the testimonies of Fontana himself and numerous parishioners from his congregation. Prior to U.S. v. Fontana, Amidon's anti-hyphenist views had remained absent from his approach to the law. This all changed with this case, as Amidon regularly overruled objections from the defense to several lines of questioning by the prosecution, which detracted from the facts of the case. As if Amidon's approach to the law were not evident enough, when Fontana was indicted and subsequently found guilty by the jury in a trial, Amidon admonished the defendant in opening court during the sentencing, stating, you received your final papers as a citizen in 1898. By the oath which you then took, you renounced and adjured all allegiance to Germany and to the Emperor of Germany, and swore that you would bear true faith and allegiance to the United States. What did that mean? That you would set about earnestly growing an American soul. That is what your oath of allegiance meant. Have you done that? I do not think you have. You have cherished everything German and stifled everything American. You have preached German prayed German, read German, sung German. Every thought of your mind has been German. Your body has been in America, but your life has been in Germany. If you were sat down in Prussia today, you would be in harmony with your environment. There have been a good many Germans before me in the last month. They have lived in this country, like yourself, 10, 20, 30, 40 years and they had to give their evidence through an interpreter. There was written all over every one of them, made in Germany. I do not blame you and these men alone. I blame my country. We urged you to come. We welcomed you. We gave you opportunity. We gave you land. We conferred upon you the diadem of an American citizenship, and then we left you. Despite the uncharacteristic outburst by Judge Amidon during Fontana's sentencing, to his credit, many of the charges brought before the grand jury were dismissed because they were not a violation of any laws. 
These included the absence of an American flag at Fontana's church, the failure to play or encourage the playing of American hymns and patriotic songs, and the conducting of masses in the German language. However, Fontana was still found guilty and sentenced to three years in prison by Judge Amidon. Fontana's case was immediately appealed to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals after his counsel filed for a writ of error. The two biggest issues which the appeal highlighted were that the charges laid out in the indictment failed to specify the time, the place, the number of, and the identities of the alleged draft eligible men in whose presence Fontana made his remarks and numerous lines of cross-examination by the prosecution. Many of these lines of questioning were objected to due to relevance, only to be overruled by Judge Amidon. What's more, the case of Kate Richards O'Hare was cited as a precedent in the defense's appeal. The main comparison between the two cases was that both had been grossly mishandled from the beginning. Fontana's conviction was subsequently overturned on appeal, a decision which brought back hope that the home front could be made safe for democracy during World War I. In the case of United States v. Henry Von Bank, the defendant, president of the Cass County School District, refused to fly the American flag on school grounds and commented that he would just as soon see an old pair of trousers hanging over the school building as the United States flag. As if these remarks were not enough to provoke charges of an Espionage Act violation, the fact that they were made in the presence of Von Bank's son a U.S. citizen of age for military service only strengthened Hildreth's case. Hildreth also argued that by refusing to fly the flag, this would negatively influence the students of Cass County, despite the fact that none of the students in the school where Von Bank worked would have been eligible for conscription. However, the school which Von Bank taught at also had a large German population. As such, Von Bank's comments could have been misconstrued as a form of protest against American entry into the war or as an encouragement of disloyalty in his students' eyes. During his testimony, Von Bank clarified his remarks, stating that his refusal to fly the flag was contingent upon weather conditions, as the flag would be severely damaged if flown during the winter. Additionally, Von Bank's remarks were made on private property and there was a law in place which did not require the flag to be flown outside on school grounds during inclement weather conditions. What's more, the school where Von Bank taught was almost one of two dozen which did not display an American flag in the district. Despite this, Von Bank was subsequently indicted after Judge Amidon overruled his attorney's filing for a demur. In the trial, Von Bank's counsel took issue with several key terms laid out in the indictment, such as men in the military or naval forces of the United States, mutiny, insubordination, disloyalty, and refusal of duty, and requested that a clear, coherent definition be provided by the court. Judge Amidon granted this request, and in the jury charge stated, you and I do not sit here to enforce patriotism in general. We sit here to enforce the original law. We do not sit here to find whether the, the defendant has been guilty of using language which is offensively unpatriotic, but whether he committed the crime charged in the indictment. Ultimately, the jury found Von Bank guilty and he was sentenced to 60 days in prison. After Von Bank was sentenced, his counsel appealed the case to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. One of the precedents cited was another espionage act tried before Judge Amidon, U.S. v. Chute. Hildreth, in the brief for why the conviction should be upheld, cited the fact that Von Bank's son, a U.S. citizen of age for military service, heard his father's remarks and that this constituted sufficient evidence of an espionage act violation. The court, however, disagreed and opted to overturn Von Bank's conviction. In the case of United States v. H. L. Trelease, the defendant, a British citizen and nonpartisan league supporter, delivered an address to an audience of over 200 people, many of whom were draft eligible, where he made particularly scathing remarks about President Woodrow Wilson and the Founding Fathers, such as, the Constitution of the United States was formed by a bunch of cocked hats in the interests of conservatives 
who were looking out for their own interests. The Constitution was written in the interests of moneyed men. And if you cut President Wilson's head open, you would find that he did not have any more brains than tree lease. As if the substance of these remarks was not controversial enough, the fact that they were made by a British citizen only increased the wartime hysteria which overcame North Dakota, given the history between the two countries. However, the irony of these remarks was that Treleese's criticism of the First Amendment possessed a certain degree of merit. Without Judge Amidon and his approach to the law, the First Amendment would have all but become obsolete in the protection of democracy on the home front during World War I. Treleese's attorney filed for a demur, only for it to be overruled by Judge Amidon. Treleese was subsequently indicted by the grand jury and at the beginning of the trial filed for a court-directed verdict in favor of the defendant, only to again be overruled. During the trial, several witnesses, along with Treleese himself, testified that in his speech, Treleese described registration for the draft and volunteering for service as a civic duty. Additionally, Treleese aided many draft eligible men with draft registration or voluntary enlistment. When it came time to decide the verdict of the case, Judge Amidon issued a jury charge consistent with his previous ones where the only two questions with which the jurors had to answer included whether the de defendant made the alleged remarks and in the case of Treleese, int intended to obstruct the recruitment and enlistment services of the armed forces. Treleese was found guilty and immediately granted a writ of error by Judge Amidon to appeal his case. Although the Espionage Act cases discussed above did at least result in the defendant being indicted, if not subsequently convicted, the one constant in each case was Judge Amidon's strict adherence to his approach to the law. In the one case which Judge Amidon did not hear, U.S. v. Kate Richards O'Hare, he was quickly able to undo the danger it brought to democracy on the home front through the precedent established in U.S. v. Chute. In U.S. v. Chute, Amidon first laid out the criteria for a valid indictment under the Espionage Act and requested a narrow definition of its language tailored to the individual case brought before him. When analyzing Amidon's approach to the law in the Espionage Act cases tried before him, his role in making the home front safe for democracy from a Fargo courtroom became undeniable and indispensable. Despite the negative scrutiny which Judge Amidon experienced during World War I, the judge religiously adhered to his legal philosophy. Over the course of the final two decades of Amidon's life, public perception dramatically changed for the better of him. Newspapers across the country seemed limitless in how much praise they could lay upon Judge Amidon hailing him as a prominent jurist and defender of civil liberties. At Judge Amidon's funeral, two U.S. Supreme Court justices, Louis Brandeis and Felix Frankfurter, both of whom cited Espionage Act cases tried before Judge Amidon, delivered telegrams read at Amidon's memorial service. Frankfurter mourned Amidon's death, stating that the country and the law have lost a noble citizen and great practitioner of justice, while Frank while Brandeis described his life as a, no, a life of noble struggle, given the daunting task which he faced during World War I to make democracy safe in North Dakota and worthwhile. Ultimately, the task of protecting free speech and civil liberties began in a Fargo courtroom and quickly encompassed the country in its entirety in significance and accomplishment.